Welcome to the Shutdown Stories Episode 2. I am here with my good friend and Rockies radio announcer, Mike Wright. Mike, how you doing, man? Doing great, Nate. You getting by all right? Yeah, yeah, hanging in there. Um, just trying to keep myself working by doing things like this. I'm really excited to have you on. Yeah, well, thanks. It's good to be with you. It's good to see you at long distance. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Practicing good social distancing here. We love yeah, it. There you go. <laughs> So let's just dive right in. Um, you were down at spring training when this all went down. You were down in Arizona. What, what was the day like when you got that news? Well, the the day was um, that kind of like it was kind of known that something was coming down. We had sort of gotten word that Major League Baseball was going to be making some kind of decisions. And we had sort of heard that the day or two before that, the rumblings of a potential spring training shutdown uh, was, you know, the, the rumblings were that it was possible, it was likely. And so when it finally came down on that Thursday morning, it really wasn't a surprise to anybody. I think everybody by that point saw it coming. It was a little bit different, obviously. And it was, um, you know, pretty much like, okay, what do we need to do is what, do, what does my boss want me to do? And he basically said, hey, if they shut this down, get on the road and come back home as soon as you can. So the packing started and, and I drove back to Denver. Yeah, I, I mean, this whole thing is just so crazy. Did you have any interactions with the players throughout this happening? Yeah, I mean, I, the players, I think, were aware of what was going on, too, and knew that it was possible. I don't know that anybody really thought it was going to get to the point that it has. And unfortunately, it's become you know pretty serious around the country and obviously around the globe. And it's sort of that dual. On the one hand, uh, there are bigger issues and there are people fighting for their lives. And there's a big health uh, perspective that sort of trumps everything. But at the same time, it's like, man, we're going to it's going to affect what you know baseball is trying to do what the players are trying to do trying to get the season started and obviously what we do as broadcasters none of that matters as much as the big picture of people being safe and healthy and with their families and all the rest but certainly from the standpoint of MLB and and broadcasting the games it, it was absolutely different you wouldn't expect something like this to happen uh, I don't think anybody expected it to be uh, to be this widespread and, and this impactful to pretty much all of our lives. So what are you doing in the meantime? What are you doing to stay sharp? Like, how are you kind of keeping on top of your craft, obviously without baseball games to call? Yeah, there really are no games to call. And, and on the one hand, as you know, I mean, you don't forget how to call a game overnight. Right. So I'm, I'm not so much worried about that, but I'm trying to just keep, keep up to date on what MLB is doing and, and the various teams just read up on sort of, you know, what they had been doing up until the shutdown, what their seasons were like, their personnel, and that kind of thing, just through various websites and, um, you know, newspapers and, and articles online around the country. And as far as work itself, I'm just doing different duties for the station. And so I, I've been hosting a show on the weekends, on Saturday and Sunday, and also doing a lot of digital work to keep the website up to date, social media up to date, you know, throughout this crisis for KOA which is obviously really important because mm -hmm. people consume their news in so many different ways now, not just over the air. So trying to keep busy and, and keep on top of all of those things all the while, you know, just take, taking some time to try and stay up to date on the doings of teams and MLB. You mentioned the, what's go, basically what's going on with the teams, what their seasons were looking like, what the outlooks kind of were. What has it been like doing that research with the MLB putting a freeze on all rosters? Yeah, it's pretty much just going back to look at what was happening with teams up until the shutdown, which was, you know, maybe two, two and a half weeks left of spring training. So teams were starting to whittle down their rosters a little bit. They were starting to send guys down to minor league camp. I know the Rockies had done that. Other teams had started doing that as well because – they knew that certain players just weren't going to break camp with the major league club, even with the extra 26th man on the roster for this season. And I, I imagine now we'll see that even bigger. At least I would think we would whenever the season starts. And so it's really just trying to get a sense of where teams were when the shutdown started. And, and you can still gain a lot from that, even though teams have sent guys down and optioned them down to, 
various levels of the minor leagues uh, since the shutdown. Uh, but, but you can get a sense between what we saw at spring training and the games we have broadcast up to that point and also, you know, where to, just sort of researching where teams were when the shutdown occurred. You can get a sense of how a team, even if you didn't follow them every day, how a team was shaping up for the season. Have you heard any news come down from the league office? Like, are you in the loop about that? What are they saying? If you're allowed not to really. tell us, obviously. Yeah, and, and not really. I mean, I, I wish I were. I'm just not at that level. And, you know, really our information comes through the Rockies. And when they get something that is pertinent to us as far as a timetable or when something might start, uh, they're going to pass it along. But we have not heard anything official on that. Um, because really, and this is just my speculating here, I don't know that baseball knows at this point because we don't know how long the health situation is going to continue to be something that has to take you know top priority. Once that sort of crests and once then hopefully it, it starts to mitigate and starts to decline, which let's hope that for all of us it's sooner than later, then I would imagine baseball will give some guidance to the teams about a potential season, what that looks like, how long, how many games. Uh, the good thing is, is that the owners and the players seemingly, if you look, look at the national reports, have agreed to a lot of the framework of that and pay issues and service time issues and all of those things for the moment when they get a green light. But until the green light comes, the only thing we've really heard is that the team will get some kind of ramp up period, probably in the Three week range or thereabouts, maybe a little shorter. I doubt a little longer, but but I suppose it could be. So, and we don't know would that ramp up period be spring training 2.0 in Arizona or in Florida? Would it be teams at their home ballparks and then try to arrange, you know, exhibition games or or games to lead up to the regular season whenever that would start? None of us have those answers right now. I don't know if MLB if if MLB has those answers, then they haven't shared them with us. Or, so we have uh, been obviously following the news about everything. Like you said, nobody quite knows how to handle this with just all the health issues that come with that number of people being in the same place. Obviously, all the players throwing the same ball. I mean, at least two guys are going to touch the ball every single play. Could be more depending on what happens. Uh, what do you see a season looking like if and when they do come back? Like, I, I heard a lot of rumors about, hey, Pretty much every day, we're going to play double headers to try to get the 162 games in. What is that going to look like if it does turn into every single game's a double header? We're going to go by two two at a time every single day. Yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't know. I mean, that's the big <laughs> answer. I'm not really sure, but here are a couple of thoughts. Number one, I think it all depends on the start date. If the start date is early June, mid June, maybe even you know late June into early July, I could see them sort of fast-tracking things to get extra games in, to try and maximize the number of games they play. I think that's going to happen regardless of when they start. But realistically, if it happens to be more around August 1st or mid-August or mm -hmm. something of that nature, there's just no way to get 162 games in to what amounts to three months. I mean, you, I don't think playing a doubleheader every day is realistic. I don't think that's realistic at all. But I do think that whenever the season starts, there will be doubleheaders. Uh, I know Rockies manager Bud Black has put out there that maybe doubleheaders are seven innings each, kind of like colleges often do. I think that's a possibility, although I don't know that it's a certainty. I think expanded rosters from the 26, which was sort of the, the expected number and the scheduled number, if you will, are uh, the, the expansion of the rosters for a shortened but still fairly intense season in terms of number of games is probably likely. What that number is, I have no idea. But if you're going to try and squeeze more games and have more double headers into a, a shorter time frame, I think from a pitching standpoint, even from a position player standpoint, just the physical toll it takes to play every day, let alone play two games twice a week or three times a week or whatever it is, I think they have to expand the rosters. Again, there's nothing official on that, but common sense sort of dictates that the rosters will be bigger than 26 when whenever the season starts so to me the big question is how long does the health crisis last and when does a ramp up period begin because once that ramp up period begins then they could say all right the start date to the season is x 
and the season is going to look like why, and there's going to be double headers, there's going to be extra games, there's going to be extra, you know, extra guys on the rosters, and all of those details get filled in. But it's a, as you know, Nate, it's a completely different picture if the start of the season is, say, June 10th versus July 28th. All of a sudden, the picture looks completely different. I like what you said about maybe it turns into double headers with seven inning games like college. And uh, to take kind of more of an analytical view of the teams saying that situation happens, how do you think that affects different teams around the league? Like, do, do you think that a team with maybe a more shallow rotation can do better in that situation? Or do you think the best teams that we look at through a 162 game season will still thrive in a shortened series like that? I think what we all know about baseball is going to apply no matter when the season starts. And that is the, the bigger amount, the larger amount of good pitching that you have, is going to help you, right? Yeah, it's okay. Not, yeah, yeah, yeah. It always starts with pitching. And if you have pitching depth, which is always something that teams are looking for every offseason, during every season, obviously, uh, if you have a deeper talent pool of pitching, that's going to help you. Would it be intensified if you're playing more double headers and trying to squeeze a greater amount of games into a shorter amount of time? I think, of course, there's no doubt about that. So obviously people are starved for any sport content right now. Let's do some MLB talk. What were you seeing down in Arizona? What, what were the Rockies looking like? Who did you see that stood out on the Rockies or on a different team that maybe they were playing? Yeah, I really like what the Rockies have done. Now, granted, we know each other well enough, but for those who don't know me, I'm usually the optimistic sort. So <laughs> I'm usually looking at the bright side. But I look at their lineup, and I say they still have a really good lineup. They still have a lot of guys who can hit. They still have a lot of guys with good track records who have produced at the major league level. On the pitching side, there's no doubt that multiple guys struggled in ways they hadn't struggled for many of them throughout their careers. I look at Wade Davis, who had the worst year of his career last year. I look at Brian Shaw, who struggled again, and that was not his track record through many years in Cleveland, although he's had some bumps, obviously, since joining the Rockies. I look at Kyle Freeland, and even though the sample size is small in terms of number of years, I can't believe that 20, what would it be, 2018, when he was fourth in the Cy Young voting, 17 and 7 with a sub ERA at Coors Field all year was an absolute fluke. I just cannot believe that. And I look at other guys in the bullpen, and then the injuries hit on top of some of the struggles early on. So there's no question for the Rockies, it's always about pitching. It will continue to always be about pitching, but I'm pretty bullish on what I thought they could do. Does that mean I thought they'd be the best, have the best ERA in the National League this year? that would be probably a little bit too high of an expectation. But I look at their top three, with Herman Marquez, John Gray, and Kyle Freeland, and I go, that's a pretty solid top three. And to your question of what I saw during spring training, Kyle Freeland completely revamped his mechanics. If you look at video of his delivery, this actual delivery from 2018 with the sort of flamingo pause, you know, or, uh, you know and, then, and then going into the delivery versus what we saw in spring training, very smooth, more traditional look. I love what I saw out of Kyle Freeland. I love his mentality, and I think he is absolutely poised to bounce back. John Gray got hurt at the end of last year, as did Armand Marquez. Marquez could have pitched probably if, if the season hadn't, hadn't been sort of tailing off anyway. But I don't see any reason why those two guys can't have really solid years, at least, if not better. The back end of the rotation, clearly a work in progress. Peter Lambert came down with an elbow issue that I don't know that we have clarity on yet, so I don't know if he can be counted on. But Chi-Chi Gonzalez, I think we know what he can bring. When he pitches the way he can, he can be a solid number number five. And then at number four, I loved what I saw out of Antonio Senzatella during spring. He's in better shape. He seems to be in better command of his pitches. The secondary pitchers were much crisper, much more effective. He had better fastball command, and so... I liked what I saw out of Senza. If, as the bullpen goes, and I know I'm rambling as an answer to your no, question. No, I love it. Please yeah, keep let, going. The people need yeah, to hear this content, ramble. Mike. Yeah, let me ramble a little bit more in terms of the bullpen. I think Wade Davis is going to be fine. I think Scott Oberg, who came on as the closer and showed he can be an effective one, is going to have a terrific year, and hopefully that still holds whenever the year starts. 
and they've got other pieces. I mean, we saw Tyler Kinley, a, a guy that they picked up off waivers from the Marlins. He was, I believe, had a uh, was unscored upon in five or six spring training outings before the shutdown. And his slider, when it's on, is devastating. And if he can keep command, in other words, keep the number of walks down, I, I expected Tyler to earn a spot coming out of spring training. Jairo Diaz, uh, Carlos Estevez, I think after a rocky first couple of outings to spring, really started to regain his form. We know Carlos can touch 100 on the fastball. It's about fastball command. And then on top of that, sort of linking the secondary pitches and the effectiveness playing off of the fastball. I think the bullpen could be, again, could be very, very good. But we've got to get to games. We've got to get to the season. That's what's so frustrating because we all want our teams to be playing. And I want to see what the Rockies can bring. So hopefully I didn't ramble too much. But that's sort of a a long-winded way of saying I saw some really good things during the spring out of the pitching staff and, and we know guys are going to hit. I think that's, and they have to do, they have to hit better, but I think a guy like Daniel Murphy will return to form. I think Ryan McMahon is poised to have, you know, a really a breakout year, even though he had a very good year last year. Nolan's Nolan, Charlie's Charlie, uh, who am I forgetting? You know, the, 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 the stalwarts in the lineup are the guy, and Trevor Story is Trevor Story. Those guys are going to produce. There's no question. Oh, Mike, as someone who makes a living with their voice, I'd be disappointed if you didn't go a little long there talking about your team. But I want to talk about I something else. I haven't had the chance. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. I'm glad I'm giving you the chance. Uh, this is obviously going to be a super weird season with the coronavirus stuff, but it was going to be weird anyways on the heels of the whole Astro scandal. And we're still waiting on whatever the league has to say about the uh, investigation into whatever was going on with the Red Sox. But how do you think that's going to play into this season now that it's going to be kind of strange from a few different angles moving forward? Well, I think before the coronavirus and its impact took center stage and started dominating everything, I think it's fair to say that we saw a healthy degree of resentment from MLB players as spring training was getting underway. And from what we had seen and heard and you know, trying to follow the reports out of spring training in Florida that, you know, fans obviously knew what was going on with the Astros and fans of opposing teams sort of let them know about it even during spring training games. So players aren't dumb. Players know what happened. Players don't feel good about what happened. And and I think we, we saw that in all of the Astros uh, as that story unfolded and developed. The big question of, is it a tainted championship? I do think it's tainted. I don't think there's any question that it is. Uh, Does that mean MLB is going to vacate the title? I think that's a completely different issue. It surprised me if MLB took that step. And and the fact that nothing's happened in that regard kind of shows me that maybe they won't, or maybe they're just waiting until the rest blows over. But there's no doubt that, that guys absolutely know, sorry about that, that guys absolutely know what went on, and I think once the season starts, guys are going to continue to remember what went on with all of that in past years. Well, Mike, I think we hit all of the major talking points. We we got your perspective as a broadcaster, someone in the booth, how the, your life's been changed throughout this. We got plenty of Rockies talk, which I know I really enjoyed. I hope everybody else does too. It's something that Obviously, our culture is starved for right now. Everybody wants new information. Everybody wants to hear what was going on. And then we hit the uh, the main talking point of the Astros. I, I, I think that's about it. What do you think? Anything else? Uh, any thoughts that you want to bring out here? No, I just I think I speak for everybody in saying, let's get the season started. And obviously, let's make sure we get through this pandemic and this crisis with everybody being as healthy as possible, everyone staying safe and everyone being smart about things. But as far as sports go, I think they we're all we're all chomping at the bit, aren't we? I know I am to get started and, and see what this baseball season can bring. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this whole series that I'm starting is because there's no sports on. I need to find a way to stay connected with everybody that I know that's working in the industry or around the industry. And uh, I, I love hearing these stories, man. I, I think it's really important for people on the outside to hear what it's like going through it from a more close-up perspective. So I I can't thank you enough for sitting down and doing this with me, Mike. Everybody at home, this has been episode two of the Shutdown Stories. Thanks for watching. Keep an eye out for episode three.
coming up here pretty soon.